Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's great having you join us today. I see some people are still entering uh, the Zoom platform from the, the waiting room. Um, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and, and get started, though. We've got an information-packed webinar today. Um, so it is a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Council of the Great Lakes Region. I am Laura Schrake, and I will be today's webinar moderator. Our webinar series and the dialogues we host are part of our Growing Business and Sustainability Network, an effort that is supported by the Fred and Barbara Erb Family Foundation. Um, the network is engaging companies and thought leaders in critical conversations about protecting the Great Lakes environment while supporting the region's economic growth. Today's webinar is going to take us into a topic that is essential for all of us, food, and an issue that we are all impacted by, climate change. We have a special guest who is going to walk us through the personal connection between climate change and the foods we love. Many of you will be aware that the Great Lakes region is known for its agriculture and food production. Men, uh, farming is one of the primary uses of land in the Great Lakes region and makes up a vital component of the region's $6 trillion economy, accounting for a substantial amount of the agriculture and agri-food trade between the U.S. and Canada. The region's fertile lands and abundant freshwater provide ideal conditions for growing variety of crops, most notably corn, wheat, and soybean. And the region also offers prime conditions for livestock, such as raising cattle for dairy production. Climate change, however, is affecting the conditions and growing seasons we have been used to and making it harder to maintain the food systems that we have relied on for so long, all while demands for the crops grown in the region increase. It is predicted that the impacts of climate change, like floods, droughts, and fluctuating temperatures, will intensify food insecurity worldwide. And while the Great Lakes region is associated with its rich farmland and plentiful yields, not to mention its large freshwater supply, it is not immune to the effects of climate change. So with us today to help us connect the dots on climate change and the foods we love is Michael Hoffman. Michael Hoffman is Professor Emeritus at Cornell University. He has published climate change articles in, popular, uh, in the popular press and is the lead author of the book, Our Changing Menu, Climate Change and the Foods We Love and Need. Mike's life experiences include growing up on a one cow dairy farm, serving in the Marines during the Vietnam War, being a father, and many years in leadership roles at Cornell University. Mike, Today dedicates his time to the grand challenge of climate change and helps people understand and appreciate what is happening by using the power of food and science-based messaging. So today, Mike will dive into region-specific examples for us and consider what strategies we need to consider for a sustainable food system. So Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to learning from you. I will hand it over to you now. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thank you, Laura. Um, it's great to be here today to talk about this challenge we face of climate change. But I'm going to offer also some solutions through using the power of food to help us confront it. And like most talks about climate change, the first part will be sort of like riding a roller coaster down. Uh, the news that comes in daily is generally not good news about climate change, but then we'll turn it around and end up with plenty of solutions for us to take home and utilize. So again, I'm very glad to be here. And I love this uh, quote from Edward Abbey, better a cruel truth than a comfortable delusion. This really applies when we're talking about climate change. A little basic background on climate change. That orange band on the surface of the earth is about eight miles high, and that's it. That's where all the action is occurring. 
related to weather and climate change. That small band, however, into which we are putting more and more greenhouse gases is warming. So imagine the sun warming the surface of the earth, that heat radiating up, encountering greenhouse gases, which absorb it and re-radiate it in all directions. So the more greenhouse gases we put in that blanket, the more heat that's captured and the globe warms. And consequently, our climates change. It's caused by us, it's not natural. If you want to get a good idea what this thin layer looks like and you're flying cross country, for example, and the pilot says we're now at cruising altitude, look down. You're essentially looking through that thin layer. Or look up and see the jet trails. That's that thin layer in which we live. It's not infinite. And most of us have seen this the hockey stick depiction of carbon dioxide variations over the years, one of the primary greenhouse gases coming from the burning of fossil fuels. The axis on the bottom goes from the year 1000 to roughly current times. And you can see up when the Industrial Revolution happened, an exponential increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because of increased burning of fossil fuels. As of a few days ago, there were 421 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. A year ago, 419. And this is pretty consistent. We're getting about two to three parts per million in the atmosphere every year, but we're already 50% higher than we should be. And that CO2 is going to last in the atmosphere from 300 to 1,000 years. Here's a different way to look at the atmosphere. And yes, that is me, but not my legs. Imagine the atmosphere being the equivalent of the bathtub. The faucet is on. This is prior to the Industrial Revolution. The faucet is on and the drain is open and the bathtub doesn't fill up. There's an equilibrium, equilibrium between the flow into the tub and the drain. However, today we've turned up the faucet, putting more and more greenhouse gases into the bathtub, into the atmosphere, and it's filling up. What we want to do now, the dark line, the black line represents where it used to be, and now the atmosphere is filling up and it's the red line, we're not going to turn this around. The goal now is to stabilize it and keep that red line from getting any higher, the atmosphere or the bathtub having more greenhouse gases in it. The report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that came out in March says it pretty straightforward. We've got some problems and the UN Secretary General states it as such. The climate Time bomb is ticking. Our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. And the report gave us about 10 years to do some serious, make some serious changes. Well, it's already July, so now we're down to 116 months. The time, time bomb is ticking. And it's tough. There was a global survey of individuals between the ages of 16 and 25 and 75%, they described their future as frightening, given climate change, 40% are hesitant children, eco-anxiety is on the rise. How are you? So why use food to tell a climate change story? When you're talking about climate change, it has to be relevant. And we all eat several times a day. It's important to our cultures, our family traditions. Food is emotional. We enjoy it. And those alcoholic beverages, also called social lubricants, help. It's also easy to talk about. It gives us unlimited stories to tell about climate change and food. The audience for this particular story is the rich world, especially the US, because in a cumulative sense, we put in more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere than any other country. But we also have the potential to adapt and mitigate and benefit the rest of the world. People often don't know where their food comes from. It's a good starting place for this story. There's a farmer's market up above where vegetables came from a nearby farm. The woman pollinating vanilla beans, one bean at a time in Madagascar is another contributor. She is out there doing that day after day. The farmer in the Midwest producing milk for us. The Aussie and his beef cattle in the background producing uh, 
producing beef that's actually imported to the US. And lower left, one of the most dangerous jobs in the US in the world is fishing in the Bering Sea in the lower right of family. In Western Africa, growing cacao or our chocolate making $4 a day. Where does it come from? From land and sea, it's people, it's changing. I like to share this information about farmers and ranchers in the US. They constitute 1.3% of the employed population. That's one in 75 people is a rancher or a farmer in the US. 98% of our parent farms are family owned. 50% require offcome income. It's a hazardous business and climate change is making it worse. If you look at the graph, the red bar reflects the percentage of farms in the US that are small. It's almost 90%. If you go over to the third column, you'll see that 3% of the farms, family farms, are large, and they produce about 40% of the goods we need in the country. Only 17%, are non-family farms producing about 17% of what we use. And why the term production here crosses everything from cotton to animal feed to human food. Point is, a lot of farms we're depending on most of which are family farms. What's happening to the plants we depend on? A plant needs air, carbon dioxide, water, temperature, good soil, and sunlight. Everything's changing except sunlight. But let's look at the air. Increasing carbon dioxide, it's up over 50%. Yes, people consider it that has a fertilization effect. In fact, plants grow faster and yield more. And you will hear people say, this is a good thing. Climate change is a good thing, but any gain from increases in carbon dioxide can be offset by more extremes. Probably the most important other fact here is the last bullet point. With increasing carbon dioxide, a lot of our major crops will have less protein, vitamins, and minerals. Rice, for example, B vitamins in rice will decline by 30% by the middle of the century affecting human nutrition worldwide, especially for individuals whose populations are already uh, have poor diets, unavailable food. But in vegetables, this is where it gets interesting. Up to 59% higher concentrations of fructose and glucose, glucose, soluble sugar, antioxidant capacity. So it's not all bad. In fact, kale might even taste better. And now we also have smoke in the air. Now, how many people realize that smoke certainly affects human health, but also affects the animals that we depend on for milk, for meat? They also are affected. Reproduction rates drop, milk production drops, weight gains drops, and disease increases. A lot of these studies have already been conducted out west where they've been on fires for many, many years now. Changes in water, globally, shifts in patterns, where it falls, when it falls, how it falls. More extremes, more downpours, more droughts. They refer to this as the whiplash, either not enough water or too much. California was in a drought for 20 years and now it got bombarded with enormous amounts of precipitation over this last year or so. Italy, in a drought for two years, 5,000 farms were inundated, flooded in the recent floods this spring, and ice melts when it gets warm. Peru and Chile export $5 billion worth of agricultural products to the US. A lot of that is irrigated, and a lot of that irrigation water comes from meltwaters from the ice cap, which will be gone in 20 years. So for the Great Lakes, annual precipitation is already up 15, 14% per year. And downpours are up 42%. More examples of whiplash. These downpours obviously make it difficult for farmers to get into the fields, to plant, to maintain the crops. And if you look at the map and look to the Northeast US and, the, uh, and Canada, you'll see that precipitation is actually going to increase towards the end of the century. I think that's a good thing for us because if you look at the rest of the North America, it's gonna get a lot drier. Changes in temperature. 
Yes, it's warming, but it's like so many things, it's not simple. First, U.S. winters are warming twice as fast as summers. Peaches, in 2017, Georgia, the peak state, had almost no peaches because the previous winter was too warm and the peach trees did not go into a required dormant state. If that doesn't happen, they don't produce. This year, the same problem in Georgia, plus they had a late frost that took care of any late season blossoms. So production is down like over 90% this year. Nights are warming faster than days. This reduces yields in corn, wheat, and barley, and certainly doesn't help keeping cattle cool in the nights of warmth. More heat waves. The Midwest used to get a devastating heat wave about every once every 100 years. Now the prediction is every six. More challenges, but also stories to tell. And the citrus up there also goes back to Georgia. 10 years ago, they had about 5,000 citrus trees. Now they have 500,000. Conditions are changing. Some farmers will be able to take advantage of this as crops move north. Warming effects right here. Warming faster in the Great Lakes region and the rest of the US. We have a longer growing season. That could be an advantage. Obviously, it's warmer to get more rain, less snow. Less ice cover on the lakes means more lake effect snow. The lakes are also warming. And instead of that cool effect they have in our fruit growing regions, it's now warmer. That cooling effect prevents early bloom of fruit, like apples, et cetera. But now without that, there's the increased chance of frost risk hitting those crops. And overall, a shift northward of crops and people in North America. And we got to get it to the table. And I'm just going to focus on the middle image. That's the Mississippi River last year. Bars just going to get through in the fall. That is the time when the heart of the U.S. and potentially Canada is moving a lot of grain for export down the Mississippi River. They couldn't. It costs billions of dollars to move that grain in other by other ways. Now, another whiplash. Just a few months ago, it was in flood stage. To the right, if you recall, the Suez Canal blocked uh, a few years ago. The implications there, that's going to happen in the future. That was not the result of climate change, but could be political unrest. A country that's hungry for food that's moving past their front door in a canal. The Panama Canal right now is in drought stage. The large ships can't get through. And on the positive side, looking to the left, that, that's the ice cover in the Arctic in the late summer. The orange line is where it should be, but because of retreating ice, there's 500,000 square miles now of blue ocean that's warming up. But ships will now be able, soon be able to move through the passage from North Asia to Northern Europe in about 40% less time and advantage. The menu, everything is changing. You've got a friend that likes scotch, we have a story for him. You've got a friend that likes wine, we've got a story for him. You name it, shrimp, tomatoes, avocados. So let's dig through this a little bit. Let's start with the for dinner drink. That's a Bloody Mary made by us by a chef as part of a film project we have. It's to me the ultimate Bloody Mary and I've learned being in a Wisconsin uh, I hail from Wisconsin. Bloody Marys are a Wisconsin thing. There's the list of ingredients in that Bloody Mary that are changing. There's a story behind each. Tomatoes getting sweeter, onions more pungent, shrimp moving, spices affected in India. It's all there, and it's a way to grab people's attention about climate change through their stomach. Salads, avocados. No, I don't know why he's wearing it. That hat. Onions, I said already pungent, made us sweeter in the salad. Avocado production will drop off in California because of higher temperatures and drought in the near future. That lovely piece of meat in the back, red meat. The way we approach the consumption of red meat is simply treat it as a delicacy, not a staple. And most people can say, say I think I can do that. Fish populations in the oceans are moving. Sardines, for example, are moving deeper and further north simply 
to find better climes, cooler waters, and avoiding warming waters. Fowl, chicken, mostly produced indoors, so they will be fine with the changing climate in general. And if we look at the burger, let's just look at the sesame seeds, 40% of which come from Tanzania and Africa, where sesame loves the new conditions. So the small farmers there are actually benefiting from climate change. Lettuce probably expand production because of more warming winters in North America. Cheese, the story, hot cows give less milk. I mentioned the reduction in nutritional quality of grain, such as wheat, affecting many things on this, this image. The rice will be affected. Spices, we get a lot of those from India. But the monsoon has changed and the temperatures are increasing, affecting all these amazing spices that we enjoy. The potatoes, fish and chips, those are chips two years ago, three years ago in the UK because of drought and hot conditions, the potatoes were a half inch shorter. So, so were the chips and people noticed. Desserts and coffee. The chocolate, again, comes from Western Africa. It's already being stressed. The coffee, I don't like to talk about this one, but in the future of coffee, about 50% of where it's grown today will not be appropriate for coffee production by mid-century. Changes there, and coffee gets people's attention. This is serious. Without ice cream, there would be darkness and chaos. The melting glaciers are bad enough, but the loss of coffee is downright terrifying. That's my quote. I like my coffee. Does anybody care about climate change impacts on their food? Well, we did a national survey last year. And one of the questions was, are you very or fairly concerned about food choices and how climate change might affect those food choices? 86% of the Democrats said yes. 61% of the Republicans said yes. Are you willing to pay more for something grown with climate friendly practices? Pretty much the same numbers. Are you interested in learning more about climate change impacts on your food? Again, similar numbers. This to me is one of the few instances where there's agreement across the political divide. People care about their food. But if you ask that standard question, is climate change a crisis? There you can see where the political divide jumps up. 60% Republican Democrats say yes. 20% say no of the Republicans. This to me opens up an opportunity to communicate about climate change through food. And in general, across all political parties, do you talk about food often or occasionally? Three quarters of the people do. They talk about climate change often or occasionally, only 35%. Can we meld those conversations and get more conversation about climate change and food together? And finally, in the survey, we asked for the first word that comes to mind when you, when you think about the effects of climate change on food. And one in five people came up with terms famine, hunger, scarcity, starvation, and shortages. Food is on people's mind. And the effects of climate change is settling on that food. It has people's attention. What do we do? I love this word confront. We need to confront climate change. Obviously, we can put our hands, heads in the sand, but that's not going to help. But synonyms for the word confront are challenge, tackle, threaten, meet head on, face up to, defy. Pick one. So what are farmers doing, the stewards of the land, to address this challenge? They're adopting something called climate smart farming with a focus on soil health. Soil is an enormous factor of climate change. If it's managed well, it can really help. Water management, too much, not enough. Diversify for crops if you can. If you've got several crops and you lose a few because of a storm, so be it. You still have an income from the others. And reduce animal stress, especially from heat. And plan or adapt as things change. What are food and beverage industries doing? They're looking at their, their risk, their supply chain. What kind of, what's happening at the source? So they're investing in the suppliers, those farmers, to make sure they got the raw product. They're encouraging climate smart farming 
They're doing things to mitigate their own impact or even considering alternative ingredients. And I love this one. A brewer in the UK came up with a beer called Toast and they used leftover bread to make the beer. And they've claimed now they've made, saved 300 million slices saved, or in other words, 300 million slices of bread converted to beer. That's creative. What is science doing? Top of the list, resilient varieties. Also focused on soil health research, water and pest management, modeling, what's gonna look like in a year or two? What do farmers have to do? And decision tools. Farmers are in a new world. It's not like it used to be. So they need help in deciding when to plant, when to harvest, et cetera. Science is offering a lot of good for the sake of our food. And one component is genetic engineering. This surprises people. There's no substantiated evidence that foods from genetically engineered crops are less safe than foods from non-genetically engineered crops. From a consumption standpoint, they are safe. The latest technology is gene editing, and it's precise. There's a piano keyboard. Imagine 32,000 keys on that keyboard. You're removing one. It's the same as removing one gene from the genome of the corn plant, which has 32,000 genes. What can we all do? I like to say, find your greater purpose. Talk about it and use food. Talking about it is absolutely critical. Understand what's going on with climate. Focus on what matters. There's a lot of things we can do, but make sure what you do matters. Get involved, find what you're best at, and be the first. If you want to change human behavior, be the first in the neighborhood to put solar on to make other advances in climate change and tell people about it because we all want to be like the other neighbor, especially the one that's leading the pack. And if you're not aware in the U.S., make sure you've looked at the Inflation Reduction Act because there are opportunities in there for all of us to save money on installation of renewable energy and a bunch of other things. So please check that out. And as Greta Thunberg says, there no one is too small to make a difference. Talk about it. Have those difficult conversations. It's the first step in tackling climate change. Suggestions, listen. Where's the other person asked? What are they, what are they thinking about? Let them know there's consensus. 99% of the experts say it's caused by us and it's happening. Focus on solutions. Hey, our company could save money. Avoid too many facts, make it relevant. Using food would work. Don't use for fear. Make it a conversation. The food's a common ground. Just imagine consumers, chefs, restaurateurs, those in the food industry, producers. There's no villains. We all eat. We need to join forces. So what about using the power of food to make a difference? Create a great awakening, which is a much deeper state of awareness and need for action on climate change, but through using food. We need to act quickly and at scale. We all eat every day. The latest idea are community meals, where we bring two people together over a meal, talk about what's happening to their food, because of climate change, participants then go out and have more of those meals. And those participants go out, essentially creating a wildfire of new knowledge and information, encouraging people to act to save your favorite lunch. The foundation for our effort is the book, Our Changing Menu, and a complimentary website that basically is also based on the book. But the website contains two databases. One on how food ingredients are changing, and the other is how plant-based products are changing. Stop and think. Perfumes, cosmetics, pet food, medicinal herbs, pharmaceuticals, anything that plants based is also changing. It's like a whole nother book to write. And back to stabilizing the climate. Who has a role? This paper by Otto and others, Social Tipping Dynamics for Stabilizing Earth's Climate by Mid-Century. They suggest help people realize the growing risk. You can do that using food. Shift from a grassroots movement to a global network. We all eat. Change your lifestyle, such as diets. Help others understand climate change in new and improved ways. Food has a role there too. 
Takeaways, climate change is real, it's caused by us, and it's getting worse. Confront it, please get involved. Find your greater purpose. Every one-tenth of degree that we can prevent warming is important. It's messing with our food. Tell others about this. And this next bullet keeps me going, because I have two daughters. Those younger than us will know we tried. We're not, maybe we're not going to solve this problem, but we're going to give it a good try. And it's a grand challenge, challenge that we can tackle if we have the will. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That was um, that was great. Um, thanks for that presentation. We had um, quite a few questions come in with the registrations, so we'll use the the next twenty minutes or so to to touch on those questions and and dive a little bit a little bit deeper into your presentation. Um, I love that you're using food as the common ground and as a um, conversation starter for climate change. I think that's really, uh, really important. Um, so let me start with the, the first question. And um, this is around fishing. Um, fishing is a part of the Great Lakes heritage and, and legacy. Can you touch on how the fishing industry is being impacted by climate change and what that could mean for the quality and the quantity of fish we consume and we're able to get from the, the Great Lakes? Sure. Um, it's a bit of a complicated story, but yes, uh, the lakes are warming and um, you know where fish reside, what they can eat, and where they like even reproduce and lay their eggs is changing. Um, warming conditions may also allow invasive species to succeed where maybe they wouldn't have been colder when the water was colder. Um, a couple of little anecdotal stories that I read was when you have ice, it oftentimes protects the young, the fish eggs and the young fish. In fact, in fact when the ice is present, you may get more growth onto which the young fish feed, but the ice is retreating. And I go fishing with my brothers on a lake in northern Wisconsin, and the walleye population has dropped. Well, it turns out that the same thing is happening. The shorelines are warming, and that poses a disadvantage for the walleye. The young don't do as well as they used to. And then think about farm runoff. <clears throat> it's more prevalent because of all these downpours and storms, adding nutrients to the lake, and we get algal balloons. So I honestly can't give a, like a prediction because what I read in, uh, um, about this issue, it is complex. Uh, the, the bottom line is they need to really study and do a better job of predicting what things will look like in the future when it comes to the fish populations in our Great Lakes. Thanks. Um, and I guess on the staying on the topic of of meats and meat protein, um, a couple of questions came in from the audience around uh, cultivated meats or lab <clears throat> lab grown meats as solutions to um, some of the challenges we're facing with our food systems. Uh, and one audience um, had shared their concern about whether the environmental benefits outweigh the energy required in order to produce the lab-grown meats. Can you share some of your thoughts around, uh, around cultivated meats? Sure. In general, cultivated meat and plant-based alternatives to meat generate fewer greenhouse gases, use less water, and use less land. So there's, you know, in contrast to traditional meat, there's some real positive benefits to using those alternatives. I may be a little out of date on the status of cultured meat, but as of a few years ago, it was still not in the market substantially and it was relatively expensive. That may be changing, but from an environmental standpoint, they're generally uh, far better than eating regular meat. 
Uh, and then I guess on with the traditional farming, can you touch on the land water energy nexus? So trying to minimize water and energy consumption while still increasing good, healthy food production. I and mean, that's a that's a balance that I think farmers are 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 trying to get to get right. Um, and so what what tools do you think that farmers need and also maybe incentives um, to sort of balance that that land water energy nexus? Well, I mean, you're asking a, a difficult and huge question, uh, but we all need to eat. We need to help our farmers as much as possible. Um, so this challenge is enormous. So I think some of the things that would help would be more research, get those varieties out there that are resilient, more refined irrigation techniques so that the water that one does have can be used as efficiently as possible. Um, this is something called climate smart agriculture, which I touched on, using the tools there to maintain high quality soil, healthy soil, because a healthy soil absorbs the water when it rains, and when there's a drought, it retains the water. So there's lots of things, um, and energy, um, it's a surprising amount of renewable energy is now produced on farms. Some of it's actually, you know, just simply, they're placing windmills on farms, others being used on farms. Um, although limited, at least in New York, anaerobic digesters, which is a way of converting manure into fuel to run farms is happening. So there's a number of things going on um, to keep the high quality food on the table for all of us, but it is a big challenge. And I, I'll go back to, uh, I need to mention also that farmers are researchers themselves. They're always trying something new and being innovative but also our academic institutions and government agencies as well as to doing research to keep them profitable and in business and again keeping food on our table right yeah and you mentioned the role of of business i think the um the role of government and and policy is is an important point as well um and that kind of uh takes me to another question that was um brought in this is sort of there's I guess two parts to this question um you talked about innovation what are some of the innovations that you have come across in the region that are supporting resilient agriculture and then I guess um the second question to is how can the new farm bill promote zero a zero carbon footprint in the ag food sector which would obviously rely on some innovations there as well well, some of the innovations, um, in some cases, farmers are buying larger equipment so they can get in and out of the fields between the storms, so to speak, uh, more efficiently and quickly. They're always testing new varieties. Um, some apple growers are simply having to start to irrigate because we get these droughts. Apple growers are also planting on high places on the farm where there's less likely a risk of frost. Frost In Minnesota, the amount of tiling of land, which is basically they're installing drainage systems under the soil, under the field, to pull off that excess uh, water has expanded greatly. Um, you think of dairy cattle and it's hot. The farmers are putting in more fan systems and, and misting systems to keep them cool making sure they always have water and watching the animals for heat stress. That's, that's a serious issue. So, um, you know, there's a lot of innovation underway. As to the farm bill, the farm bill parts of it are critically important to our food security. They, again, I'm gonna to refer to climate smart agriculture they're funding conservation programs that focus on soil health. They're supporting projects that um, encourage cover crops, which hold the soil in place when you don't have a crop in place. Um, 
Farm Bureau support research. And all of these things are really important. Um, again, for, for our farmers, um, you know, back to new varieties, new techniques, uh, and the research that we need um, are really important. And I guess what we can do uh, related to the Farm Bill is make sure funding is increased for all of these programs. There are some challenges facing the Farm Bill and whether or not some of these climate components will remain in it. We all need to do our part and contact elected officials to encourage them to include these components, these climate change components in the Farm Bill for the sake of our food. That's a great point. And what, what commodities do you think are at most risk in the, in the short term? Hmm. I have to think about that. Um, let me put it this way. This is an opinion. I don't have it based on literature that I've read, read, and read but I would given what's happening to some of our fruit crops with these surprise late frost, the changes in the temperature of the Great Lakes, making them more susceptible to those frosts. Uh, irrigation is not available is it would be a challenge for fruit crops. So I think, and all they're, they're sensitive. And there's a story also about hail will actually get larger with climate change. And hail and apples, don't get along very well. So if you have a hailstorm, that can literally, you know, just damage the crop completely. So it's almost worthless. Um, so I, yeah, I'm picking fruit. I think our corn and wheat and those sort of things will be okay. There's also other places where they are grown, not just in the Great Lakes that we can use as a source if uh, we have trouble here. But um, yeah. I mean, vegetables could be up there too, especially they being sensitive to these storms and floods simply because they're growing close to the ground. And if a crop is contaminated by a flood, let's say upstream, there was a contaminant put into the stream and it floods your field, your field, you have to destroy that field. Yeah, and, um, you know, I guess, uh... You know, farmers don't hold a, a hold a crystal ball, so they're having to really sort of troubleshoot and adjust for a lot of different scenarios that they they just don't know what they're going to get until right this the season. It's not like you know what grandfather experienced at all. That's right. Um, one question that came in, which I I found quite interesting, um, is the question about how is climate change impacting food waste? Um, you mentioned hail and apples don't get along. So, I mean, there is a chance that, you know, there could be a lot of uh, produce that ends up wasted that can't be um, taken to the grocery or the farmer's market. Um, what are your, your thoughts on how climate change is impacting food waste? That's a really cool question. Um, I've never been asked that before, but uh, just for the record, most food waste occurs at the consumer end. That's us, you know, someone who's you know in a restaurant or at home or um, in a market, for example. But let's look at the supply chain. Um, let's start with the farm. Well, we've got these storms. Now this. Maybe the terminology we get confusing is it a loss or a waste, but simply it's no longer in the, in the supply chain. Um, one of the recent hurricanes wiped out hundreds of acres of citrus in Florida. It's simply not the fruit off the trees. That's never going to make it to market, so it's wasted. Um, you think about transportation. Well, we have more floods that interfere with road traffic as well as the example I gave of the Mississippi River. So what if they didn't have an alternative way to transport those tons and tons, millions of tons of grains besides not using barges, that would all be potentially wasted. Um, another one is, and I'm gonna use processing tomatoes in California. So in the future with warming conditions, 
it's a couple hundred, maybe 250,000 acre crop. Now it matures over a span of time, but with that increased heat, more of it's gonna be, have to be harvested in a narrow window of time. Will they do that? Is the infrastructure there to actually do that? If not, it's gonna be wasted. So, and then think of power shortages for processing facilities or storage facilities um, or your refrigerator at home. So mm -hmm. more waste could occur because of climate change through those variety of ways. Good question. Yeah, that's a, a great question and great, great answer and definitely something that needs to be to be considered um, more. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So we have um, several other questions. I'm going to try to try to squeeze in before um, our time is up. One question um, came in asking what Native American tribes uh, can do to combat the effects of climate change. Um, and I guess, you know, we could also ask how can we be, how can all communities be working together to support healthy food systems, um, including those indigenous communities? Well, I, my first response to that is also, um, given their heritage, can they offer advice? with everything from crop varieties to techniques that may have been forgotten over the decades. But I think your comment about community, I think we all need to come together to uh, tell the story of climate change using food. Um, and they may have some wonderful stories, some things have changed over the years. So they could really bring uh, powerful stories to this, to this narrative. Um, but also um, become active, get involved uh, politically, otherwise. Um, set an example for others. That's how things change when you become the first to do something. So I suggest there's lots of opportunities for um, all of us to contribute that to, to this greater challenge, to this cause. Yeah, and sharing best practice and... and um and the stories of successes um, is great. Yes. Um, what, are, what are some of the observing or monitoring needs um, and to track the implications of climate change on food over time? Um, the question is what sorts of climate observations are useful? Well, I think I touched on you know, the changes that are happening to the the air, the temperature, more extreme weather, um, and water. So monitoring all of those factors will be terribly important and observing changes over time. And um, I think that's really important. Something else sort of part of this is the models we have oftentimes aren't downsized enough another downscale. So they're sort of like, okay, we can do the north northern part of a state, but we can't do a county or we can't do a farm to get really. So I think that sort of thing would really help too. And then, uh, you know, having those models, but also the data from that really fine scale, fine grade observation would be really, really helpful to help communities and farmers at the local level know what's happening and how changes are going to occur, and you know what to think about for the future. I think that's the other one. Um, and, and these observations are useful, but I think there's another piece to all of this, and that's we still are operating in a reactive mode as opposed to a proactive. Um, you know, can we use some of these monitoring tools to help us again identify what's going to happen in the future, and instead of waiting for it to happen, be proactive. Like, okay, um, if I'm in New York, I look at what crops are succeeding in Pennsylvania. When do I start adapting them? When do I start using them? So having these tools could help us determine, okay, uh, two years from now, you ought to be using this variety of wheat. It will do fine. Because uh, I think we're still reacting instead of planning and thinking strategically ahead and being proactive in climate change. And you know, with these new models, Etc. We can get closer and closer to that, but that also means a lot of monitoring on the ground. Mm -hmm. And how how do you think those 
the models on a more um, detailed look, like a, at a county level, would would you expect those to vary much from county to county um, based on the crops that they're they're growing and the the impacts of climate change on on those areas? I think maybe not a lot of variation, but enough. Let's, let's say you've got a, a big river basin through one county. So the risk of floods are much higher there than the neighboring county. Or something about the topography, just altitude, you know, that um, you know, you better really have those apples at a higher elevation by you know 10 years from now, or it's going to get worse. So I think there's enough information a valuable information at that scale to help us from county to county. But then again, if you're bear with me talking about Nebraska where it's flat and everything's pretty much the same, then it may not be that important. But someplace like around the Great Lakes where we have these other bodies of water and so on and topography is different would be more important. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, great. Um, and I'm going to go back to nutrition, you mentioned um, it during your presentation. I'm just wondering if you can maybe go um, comment a little bit more on the impact of reduced plant nutritional quality due to higher atmospheric carbon dioxide. There have been a lot of studies on this topic. And um, again, in our staple crops, we rice and soy, et cetera, where they have essentially grown these crops under conditions of higher CO2, even in the field, they can actually increase the CO2 level in a field condition and grow them. They see these changes um, and they're, they're concerning. Uh, again, if you think of 30% decline in B vitamins in rice, well, there are tens of millions of people around the world that depend on rice that are Ready already might be a, a sort of challenged dietary conditions. Um, essential minerals and protein are another big ones. So I think these are, well, let's put it this way. On the upside, you know, can our plant breeders keep up? Because that would be one way to address this and, you know, sort of offset the effect of increasing CO2 by breed crops that do just as well under the higher conditions and are, you know, and are remain nutritious. That's, um, that's a real global impact that I don't think enough people appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, have, <clears throat> we have a question that came in and I believe it's um, referring back to one of the slides in your presentation about um, how fam a family owned farm is defined. Um, I think that was a well. You can um, you can clarify. Um, they're saying that ninety eight percent of family owned farms seems high. So wanting to understand how it's defined and and perhaps that um, graph was um, speaking on a global rather than a regional basis. I can't, I can't recall actually. The graph was of U.S. agriculture. Okay, U.S. agriculture. United States. So, yeah, can you clarify on how that uh, family farm is defined? It's it's essentially, um, I guess, owned by a family. You know, maybe the head of the family, but then family members are part of that operation as well. So it's truly, it's just not one individual. It's that individual, and whether that could be male or female, and many females operate farms. Uh, it's truly a family operation, like you would envision a family. And okay, so it's not it's not necessarily based on the acreage or no. heads of cattle or no. okay. No. no. <clears throat> okay, thanks for thank you for clarifying that. Pretty much like the the nature of the management is a is a family. Okay. Okay, that's great. Um, and I think that um, the question that I'll end with, uh, because this webinar is part of our business and sustainability series, and, and you did touch on it uh, earlier, but just maybe ending on, again, your thoughts on the role of business and industry in tackling these issues. Um, and what can we, what can businesses do to help uh, combat climate change? Uh, and support healthy food systems? Well, our youth 
say that government moves too slow and the big corporations are sort of second in line with not doing enough. Um, on the flip side, there are some very large corporations and businesses doing great things um, in this space. So I guess for a business, it's, um, okay, look at your carbon footprint. You know, I mean, if you're, now we're looking sort of at a global perspective and protecting food, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions across the board. So what can a business do? A lot, you know, energy conservation. Um, can you switch over to electric vehicles or just all kinds of things? Uh, I just returned from the, ne the Netherlands looking at their horticultural industry and was amazed at how much heat they are tapping from the earth to warm their greenhouses by way of ge geothermal technology. And they capture the heat in a greenhouse in the summer and capture that and use it for the winter as well. I mean, it's, it's or, or vice versa in the wintertime, they capture the cool temperature stored in the water and use it in the summer to cool. So that's, that's a specific industry but a very large one related to food and they're doing remarkable things in the Netherlands. So I think, yeah, look at your, your footprint, look at your employees, are they empowered to make a difference? And if you wanna change a culture, which I've been, had the opportunity to do in a small organization, empowering everybody to make it to, in a sense, give them a greater purpose. It no longer is necessarily an eight to five job, but it becomes more than that because they've got a bigger purpose uh, address climate change, save the company money, whatever it might be. And um, so those are the few things that just come to mind that you know, businesses play a huge role in this um, at the global scale. And then regarding food, um, I interact with some global companies that have dining halls in their facilities for their employees. Well, what can be done there? More nutritious, more uh, low carbon intensive or more low emission intensive foods being served, et cetera, to um, in part change the culture, but also do their part. And there, there's, a, I think, a whole num number of other things that can be done to help in this broader field of sustainability, but also uh, address climate change from the biz business perspective. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And I know we've um, we've been in touch with a lot of companies that are headquartered and operating in the Great Lakes who are really, um, you know, doing their part with uh, sustainability and and investing in innovation and, and research. So um, there's certainly an impact that businesses can can have on on this topic. Um, Mike, thank you so much for sharing your passion and your knowledge on this topic with us today. I think that your approach to using the power of food to connect people and to start the conversation around climate change is really impactful and really important. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, we did put a link to your book in the chat for our audience. It will be shared again whenever we circulate the recording to this webinar next week. Um, so again, thank you, Mike, for your time. Thank you to our audience for, for joining us and have a great rest of your day. And thank you very much for the opportunity.